morning. It's good to be able to share uh, worship together. The churches of Robert Tabernacle and Brockworth Free Church. Uh, led this morning by our good friend Simon Helm from Dursley, to whom we offer sincere Christian greetings to you and your fellowship. Can we just take a moment of quietness, however? For it is uh, with great sadness that we record the loss of a good friend to our church, in Vivian Fryer. Lord, we thank you for Vivian Pryor, for what she brought to our fellowship here. Her gifts of kindness, gentleness, simply being. And we celebrate those gifts and commend her to you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Psalmist writes, O oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples, sing to him, sing praise to him, tell of all his wonderful works, glory in his holy name, that the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again. This 
prayer is taken from the prayer handbook, especially for today, written by James Ashdown. Unexpected Potential So let us pray. Lord, we are small and easily overlooked, but in your eyes we are seeds which contain within them unlimited growth. Lord, we are only a teaspoon of dust, but in your kingdom we are yeast which brings life to the heaviest of doughs. Lord, we are seeking prosperity, but when we find your treasure we discover a joy greater than wealth. Lord, we are searching for the secret of life, but we will only discover it when we are caught in the net of your love. Amen. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all your seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and perch in its branches. This reading is taken from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 13, beginning at verse 44. The parable of the hidden treasure. The kingdom of heaven is like this. A man happens to find a treasure hidden in a field. He covers it up again and is so happy that he goes and sells everything he has and then goes back and buys the field. The parable of the pearl. Also, the kingdom of heaven is like this. A man is looking for fine pearls. And when he finds one that is unusually fine, he goes and sells everything he has and buys that pearl. The parable of the net. Also, the kingdom of heaven is like this. Some fishermen threw their net out in the lake and catch all kinds of fish. When the net is full, they pull it to shore and sit down to divide the fish. The good ones go into the buckets. The worthless ones are thrown away. It will be like this at the end of the age. The angels will go out and gather up the evil people from among the good and will throw them into the fiery furnace where they will cry and gnash their teeth. New Truths and Old Do you understand these things? Jesus asked them. Yes, they answered. So he replied, This means then that every teacher of the law who becomes a disciple in the kingdom of heaven is like a homeowner who takes new and old things out of his storage room. Thanks be to God. Welcome to you all at Rodborough. It's great to be with you. My name's Simon Helm. I'm the Area Minister for the United Reformed Church in Gloucestershire. And uh, it's good to celebrate and uh, share with you some thoughts about this reading uh, from Matthew's Gospel. Uh, the lecturer has been looking at a couple of the parables of Jesus over the last few weeks. And now we've got our last one, or, or rather our last five. Uh, the text gives us five ways to imagine the kingdom of heaven, more specifically God's will being done on earth as in heaven as we pray each week in the Lord's Prayer. So it's like a mustard seed, it's like yeast in flour, it's like treasure hidden in a field, it's like a priceless pearl and it's like a net that catches all kinds of fish. That's probably four images too many for one sermon. So I'm just going to focus on the mustard seed. And I think this parable is a bit of a joke. I think Jesus is having a bit of a laugh. 
There's uh, many jokes about gardening. Those of you who are into gardening will probably know many of them. A young boy asked his uncle what he puts on his rhubarb. And the uncle said, usually the best horse manure. The young boy replied, well, I usually have custard with mine. This parable is a joke by Jesus. And let me explain. A key to interpreting Jesus' teachings about the kingdom of heaven is that there is almost always a reversal from our current social practices and customs. The last shall be first, the first shall be last, anyone who seeks to save their life will lose it and so on and so forth. So how is the mustard seed like the kingdom of heaven? Well, for one thing, it's small instead of mighty. Usually, although these times are anything but usual, if you go to the cinema during the summer, there is any number of summer blockbusters to choose from because this is what the public wants and pay good money for. Uh, something on an epic scale, a, a dramatic spectacular, scenes of devastation, then ultimate victory. You don't pay good money to get homely tales about baking, do you? I wonder if the crowds who heard these parables were disappointed, as perhaps maybe were some of the disciples. Jesus tells one more parable about seeds and plants, followed by stories of baking bread, plowing a field and fishing. Oh, come on, Jesus. There's no kings. There's no warriors. There's no princes to populate these parables of the kingdom of heaven. No military generals or revolutionary leaders to please the, the zealots, Simon or his colleague Judas. They must have felt let down, even shocked. I wonder if you're a bit let down too. If I said, what was your vision of the kingdom of heaven? Would it include weeds and housework? God is more often seen as the Lord and King rather than a farmer and a housewife. Likewise, most contemporary Christian songs and traditional hymns sing about enthroning Jesus, uh, the victory of Jesus, raising him up and exalting him in the highest heaven and stressing the great conquest over evil and suffering. Yet Jesus tells stories of his kingdom that are down to earth and very humble. Ordinary actions of ordinary people going about doing, well, ordinary things. Hardly the exalted vision of God's realm. Of course, that is the whole point. As Christians, we're called to believe in the incarnation, the mystery of the meeting between the divine and the human in the person of Jesus. And in his parables, Jesus puts that incarnational focus not on himself, but on the world around him. The kingdom of heaven is like, well, the most common things in the world. Like Jesus himself, this everyday world embodies the sacred meeting of the divine and the human. If only we had the eyes to see and the ears to hear. One of the uh, most influential books I read in my Christian life was Gerard Hughes's God of surprises in which he says that the treasure of faith is small and within us it is our inner life where we find and experience God but often we're ashamed of the sacred to look there he uh, starts the book by discussing a number of people who had great inner wealth the seed of faith within but who didn't know it Jock was a Scot, predictably with a name like that. He was tall and he was broad. He was an unemployed interior decorator. He had a natural sense of wonder. He confessed to walking in the mountains, 
sitting on the top of peaks feeling very small but very happy. Maybe you do the same. But he wouldn't share his feelings with his mates because they'd just think he was strange. Hugh said to him that wonder is the beginning of wisdom and the happiness he felt was a taste of the joy of humility which is a glad acceptance of our weakness and our dependence on God. He had the gift of contemplation but as undue regard for the opinion of his mates was likely to stifle any growth of the spirit in him. Jane was uh, a university student who was uh, looking forward to having a year abroad in Spain because she didn't have to pretend to be a good Catholic anymore and she could skip going to church and avoid trouble with her parents. She wanted eventually to go on and teach in Peru in some of the poorest communities to share something of what she'd received. Hughes asked her, did she think she had a vocation from God? Don't be silly, she replied. She was quite certain there was nothing religious in what she was experiencing. Religion for her was going to mass and observing the rituals of the Catholic Church. And she found mass a bore and the statements from the church about the world had no meaning for her. She wanted to drop the lot and just live. She thought of herself as unspiritual and irreligious, yet Hughes said her dominant emotion was compassion. She wanted to serve and to share what she'd been given, yet such was her notion of God and the church and religion that she considered herself unspiritual and irreligious. Hughes gives other examples of people who have inner wealth, but they don't realise it. They often misread it, and in no case do they consider that it's got anything to do with God or Christ. Yet he affirms that those inner experiences are opportunities for meeting God. One theologian has said the kingdom of God comes in inches, and we must learn to celebrate every small glimpse that we can. The kingdom comes when every unemployed person finds a job, every addict gets sober, every poor child stays in school and gets an education. The kingdom comes in the care of love for someone who's supporting the disabled or the terminally ill. You get glimpses of God's love and the preciousness of life at the centre of the universe. It's not blockbusting stuff but it's those glimpses, those small glimpses of the kingdom of God. These are the mustard seeds of hope that surround us. The second thing about this parable of the mustard seed is that it's a weed. It is mostly considered a weed instead of a desirable crop. Being a weed means it grows in places where it's not welcome, where it's not cultivated. Many of Jesus' disciples, upon hearing the parable of the mustard seed, probably realised that this was a story of a gardener who was deliberately sowing in a, a little tiny time bomb into his plot. Let me just try and place it in a biological context. Think mint, or bamboo, or kudzu, or ivy. If you plant mustard, it's there to stay. And being a weed, means it characteristically is outside of human control. Weeds do not require our assistance or participation in their coming into being and growth. And for another thing, the mustard shrub is hardly up to the prevailing image of for the kingdom of heaven. The mighty cedars, the cedar trees of Lebanon, Yet here in the parable, God's kingdom is like a weed. So they would have got it as a bit of a joke. Many of the people of the land to whom Jesus directed his teachings would have no doubt known how invasive this species could be. 
But being observant Jews, they would more likely have been struck by the unorthodox nature of the act itself. In effect, it amounted to an offence against God's covenant with Israel. Sowing such a plant in the midst of a garden, which was designated exclusively, say, for vegetables, would have been a clear violation of the law of diverse kinds. Leviticus 19 says, You shall not let your animals breed with a different kind. You shall not sow your fields with two kinds of seed, nor shall you put on a garment made of two different materials. And though this statue seems ludicrous to most of us living in the 21st century, the intent of the prescription was to honour the order of creation and thereby faithfully revere the Creator who deigned to choose Israel as God's people. So in offering this allusion, Jesus appears to be making at least two important points. First, through the kingdom of God, which has been inaugurated through Jesus' teaching and ministry, a new covenant has been introduced in which the disruption of the old order has begun. Mustard can now flourish alongside other species, just as Gentiles can be welcomed into the Jewish fold. And secondly, this new covenant will undermine the former one, and especially the oppressive aspirations of the most obvious invasive species of Jesus' time, the Roman Empire. Yeah, the mustard seed is an inspiring metaphor for what our individual faith might accomplish, but ultimately its real power lies in the uncontrollable love of God and the redemption of all creation, the transformation of all. There is a, a wildness to the kingdom of God. It is out of control. Now that's disconcerting for us who like religion that is controlled and even controlling. We like to control life. We like to maybe control others for we get uncomfortable with too much enthusiasm. We like an ordered garden. Weed three, don't we gardeners? Coronavirus has been stressful for many because we are no longer in control of life. But control has its downside. Uh, in reaction, we can turn to events and ideas that push the edges. And those edges can push us beyond our comfort zone. And we can be too wild. So we move between extremes in our society, too controlling and too out of control. And the role of the church is to help us to be uncontrolled in ways that issue in a more beautiful reality. Yeah, in the church, we get comfortable with things as they are, don't we? Tradition becomes traditionalism, as if this is how it has always been and always will be. Tradition is a, a living organism, changing and responding to new hints, new glimpses of the uncontrollable God. So let's pray that God is working God's purposes out during this pandemic to bring us into a new and better reality. Out of the chaos may come something beautiful. Finally, uh, mustard had an important function amongst Jews and Gentiles in Jesus' time as an agent of healing. Uh, the Roman historian Pliny makes clear the pungent taste of the mustard seed was often used for seasoning and not least of all for medicinal purposes. He writes, pounded it is applied with vinegar to the bites of serpents and scorpion stings. It counteracts the poisons of fungi. For phlegm it is kept in the mouth until it melts or is used as a gargle for hydromel. For toothache it is chewed. It is very beneficial for all stomach troubles. It clears the senses, and by the sneezing caused by it, the head. It relaxes the bowels. It promotes menstruation and urine. Well, let's not linger long on the power to relax bowels, but rather how useful mustard seed was for curing many of the ills that 
beset us as mortal beings. How much more appealing to think about the spread of this invasive species, this metaphor for the kingdom of God, mustard, as a reintroduction of health and healing into our world. We uh, conceive of God's kingdom as existing in some nether realm where the moths and rust do not destroy, some heavenly sphere far removed from the drudgery of our day-to-day -day existence. And in so doing, we too often overlook our true vocation as citizens of this new world order, God's kingdom, that is, to be a healing presence here and now. So this parable is no uh, simplistic allusion to the miraculous growth of any old seed. It's about mustard. Yes, we can apply it to our personal lives, knowing that even the smallest measure of faith can move mountains. Our faith can be mustard. But more importantly, we need to begin acknowledging its significance for our social and our political lives as well. The inauguration of God's kingdom has begun and through the Creator's grace it will soon come to its full disruptive fruition. In the meantime, we've got two roles to play. First, we must in all things act as an equally disruptive presence in the midst of the old order, the way things are, the status quo. But perhaps our greatest calling is to be what mustard has long been in the Mediterranean basin of the first century, a healing presence. Maybe this was the original reason for the gardener sowing this plant in the first place. If so, how much more should we allow ourselves to be cast as seeds of peace into a broken world? Amen. Let us pray. Loving God, today we're thinking in particular of our friend Geoffrey Fryer, whose wife Vivian died unexpectedly last Sunday. We pray for him and for his daughter Catherine and for all their family and friends who will miss her so dreadfully. All of us at the top will miss her too. Our thoughts are with them. We pray for all who've lost loved ones and are struggling at this time. Be with them, Lord, and comfort them in their grief. In these uncertain times, as the COVID lockdown is gradually easing for us in this country, Many of us feel insecure and confused. We're happy to have more freedom, but anxious about going into populated places. Many were looking forward to holidays or special events this summer, which can no longer take place. But help us to appreciate the opportunities that are all around us and to explore new things. Others have far more serious concerns about losing their jobs and their livelihoods, about businesses that are struggling and facing closure. Give us the courage to take one day at a time and to put our trust in you. We think of all those who've been trapped in abusive relationships and environments during this lockdown, unable to escape. We pray that help will come and they will find safety. We pray for our local refuge here in Stroud and for the other agencies which support families who have suffered from domestic abuse and help them to make a new start in life. We pray for countries where the virus 
is still at its peak and thousands of people are still dying. We pray for refugees living in overcrowded conditions, far away from their home. We pray for the people of Yemen, living in fear and facing starvation. Be with them, Lord, and be with all who are in trouble at this time. And now we will just have a few minutes of silence for you to bring before God the things which are concerning you today. We thank you, Lord, that you are always there for us. Remind us to say, stay close and seek your help. Amen. this morning and, and making us ready to seek the kingdom in the places where God calls us to be at home, at work at leisure so we go into this week confident in the love of God and in the knowledge of the blessing of God Father, Son and Holy Spirit with us now, with us always Amen